The 44th Annual National Groundwater Association National Convention and Exposition was held in Las Vegas, Nevada, September 30th, 1992. A highlight of the National Convention is the keynote presentation given by the Darcy Lecturer. The Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecturer Program is sponsored by the Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers. The association annually chooses an individual to be offered as a visiting lecturer to a number of universities in North America. This program honors the historical discovery by Henry Darcy in 1856, which established the physical basis on which groundwater hydrology has been studied. Dr. John Wilson is the professor of hydrology and director of the hydrology program at the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology in Socorro, New Mexico. He is a BCE graduate of the Georgia Institute of Technology and holds MS, CE, and PhD degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He taught groundwater at MIT for eight years and then spent a year with Interra Incorporated before joining the hydrology program in Socorro in 1984. Dr. Wilson's present-day research interests include the fundamental fluid mechanics of permeable media flow transport, primarily using flow visualization tools and mathematical modeling. Dr. Wilson's keynote topic will be visualization of groundwater flow and transport through a microscope. He was invited to 31 universities during the 1991-1992 school year to give this particular lecture. The following was taped at the National Groundwater Association National Convention held in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm uh, from a little school in New Mexico called New Mexico Tech, as Warren mentioned. It has about 1,000, 1,200 students. Uh, also, maybe a dozen staff members doing groundwater hydrology research. The, um, uh, at, at a professional level and, and 40 graduate students uh, working uh, with us, so maybe 50 altogether. Um, the town has about, oh, I don't know, 5,000 people in it altogether. The county, roughly the size of uh, Rhode Island, has uh, maybe 10,000 people. So we have the world's largest uh, per capita population of groundwater hydrologists. And I'm the only one of them who's here today, as it turns out. Um, we started about five years to uh, study groundwater flow in uh, porous media at a pore scale, uh, having learned some lessons from the petroleum engineers. The basic idea was to look through a microscope and see what we could do, uh, see what we could observe. Um, backing that up are quite a few other experimental techniques we use. So as you see what I'm going to uh, demonstrate to you this morning, don't get the wrong idea. This is not a tool in and of itself to use to characterize a groundwater pollution site or to design a remediation scheme. It's a conceptual tool used to help better understand certain issues that you must explore uh, with other laboratory uh, experiments, with field experiments, and with practice in the field, and for some of us anyway, mathematical modeling as well. Um, before I get started, I should also mention the things I'm going to show you have had a variety of sponsors. Besides the sponsorship uh, of this lecture tour by the uh, by the uh, uh, American uh, Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers, there is uh, sponsorship of the research itself by uh, the Department of Energy Subsurface Science Program and EPA and, and several others. And there have been quite a few graduate students who participated in the research, and I should acknowledge at least two of the most senior of those who've done a lot of the work. One is Steve Conrad at the Sandia National Labs, and the other is Jamin Wan, who is uh, currently uh, finishing up and looking for a position, as it turns out. Uh, and I'll tell you about her work toward the end of the talk. Uh, can we have the first slide, or can I just advance them here, I guess? Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about two flow visualization techniques. The first are called etched glass micromodels, and I'll show you how we build those kinds of models. Uh, it's very similar to building silicon chips, as it turns out. The second is a method of freezing an experiment in place in the sand pack and then diagnosing what's been going on. Uh, Micromodels, the etched glass kind, are, are uh, physical models of a pore space network. And they're made by taking some kind of pattern, a pore pattern that you're interested in, etching it onto glass, doing that onto two pieces of glass, making mirror images of the network in terms of, in a form of channels on each piece of glass, and then putting those together 
and fusing them in a, in a furnace and then making a series of channels. And the pores that result have a very complex three-dimensional structure, although the pattern that they describe is two-dimensional. And here on the right, uh, we see some of those. Now, I can't tell how well these show up in, in the light. We may need to have some of the light off for most, uh, most of these uh, microscope slides. And I'm not sure who's in charge of the light, so I'll just uh, leave it to somebody to, to figure out. Right in here, we have a pore body. That's part of a pore space that's larger than its surrounding uh, areas. This is a piece of solid material. Here's another one. These are like grains of sand. And here in here, we have a pore throat between two of these, let's say, grains of sand, where the pore space is relatively narrow. And the geometry of these things, larger parts of the pore system called pore bodies and smaller ones called pore throats or, or uh, uh, well, call them narrow areas if you want, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, this geometry plays a large role in, in a lot of what we see in a variety of situations. In this particular micromodel, what you're looking at are air bubbles trapped in some liquids. And the two liquids are shown. In red is a non-aqueous phase liquid. Uh, it turns out to be an oil in this case. And water, which is in, in blue. And right in here, you see water as a pendular ring filling a pore throat between two solid grains. Okay. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, a pendular ring is that, that cusp of liquid that's created between two objects, such as uh, 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 two grains of sand with water. Uh, since this is on videotape, I hate to do this. But if you take your fingers and you stick them in your mouth, <laughs> and you put some saliva on your fingers, and you play with the thing that, that results, that's a pendular ring. <laughs> yes, it's disgusting, isn't it? Um, this is how we make the micromodels. Uh, there are a variety of ways of doing it. This particular fabrication procedure, we start off with a piece of mirror. And it has a backing on it, which we strip off. And that reveals a copper surface beneath. We then take some Kodak photoresist, cover that copper surface with a photoresist, cover that with a transparency of the pattern we're interested in, the network of pores we're interested in. And we then expose it to ultraviolet light. And what that does is it fixes the photoresist everywhere the ultraviolet light hits. And it doesn't get fixed where the pattern is. And then when we uh, take it out of, the, uh, uh, out of that system, we can uh, then remove the photoresist everywhere it was not fixed. And we can then remove the underlying uh, copper with an acid everywhere uh, the pattern exists. And we can remove the underlying glass with hydrofluoric acid and create a series of etched channels. And if we do that to two pieces of glass and then put them together in using mirror images of the pattern and put them together in a furnace and fuse them, uh, we end up with pores like this. This is a scanning electron micrograph through one pore of this system. It's a rather large pore. It's about 500 microns in size in that direction and 300 or so or 400 in the vertical direction. This is the upper piece of glass. This is the boundary between the two pieces of glass. And down here is the lower piece of glass. Uh, and you can see you have to match these things relatively well to, uh, to have this procedure uh, work. I was recently visiting a lab where people were trying to fabricate microchips uh, versions of these same things, where the scale of this pore might now be one micron in size. We, we go as low as 10 to 20 microns. Uh, a couple of things to observe. When we look at these experiments, we're going to be talking about the geometry of this particular pore space. And one thing you may observe is it has some, some niches or crevices or wedges over here in the corner. The walls are not vertical, nor is this pore cylindrical. A cylindrical pore is a nice conceptual model, but it's not very realistic. If you took a real sand, for example, and impregnated it with epoxy or wood's metal and made a casting of what the pore space looks like and removed the sand with an acid, what you would get would have lots of crevices and wedges in that pore space. These things exist in, in real systems. They're a little artificial here in their geometry, but it's a lot more real than just pure uh, cylindrical pores. So we have pore wedges, and I'll refer to those later on. Up here toward the top of the pore, I'm going to refer to that as the ceiling and the bottom as the floor, just thinking of it as a room, as in the room we're standing in. And um, I'm going to talk about those uh, because they play a, sp uh, a special role in this particular geometry. In all the experiments we examine, we're going to be looking down at this pore from the top, through the top plate of glass. And you have to understand that orientation. At the same time, much, many of the experiments are going to have light being transmitted up from below. So we're going to be doing transmitted light microscopy in these experiments. Okay. 
These are two photomicrographs of one micromodel that's quite small. This micromodel is about the size of my thumbnail altogether, and it has thousands of pores in it. This pore right here is 10 microns across. Okay? This is a solid grain. That's a solid grain. This is a pore body. This is a pore throat. Uh, this is a uh, dark field microscope uh, picture uh, to illustrate some of the three-dimensional uh, aspects of the pore system. And you can see that the wedges here are not so pronounced. The walls are much more vertical. This is the same micromodel, just a different part of it on the right. And we're looking at it with, instead of with dark field microscopy, we're looking at it with transmitted light microscopy. This is the solid material here where the glass is fused together. And these are the pores, the poor, poor uh, throat in here and I would say a poor body out there. Um, and that's the, that's the view we're going to have for all of these experiments, this transmitted light bit. Okay. Let's take a look at one simple application of this thing, uh, one that's near and dear to everybody's heart these days in groundwater contamination. Uh, and that is the spill of a non-aqueous phase liquid of some kind. It can be one of two different kinds of non-aqueous phase. It can be a uh, dense non-aqueous phase, well, as we have here on the right of this picture, or a uh, light non-aqueous phase, which is what we have on the, on the left. Um, the dense one is heavier than air, and so it moves down through the Vado zone displacing air. It's also heavier than water, so it uh, moves further down the system through the, the water phase until it more or less hits the bottom of the aquifer. There's enough of it. And as it moves down through these systems, it leaves behind a trail of capillary trapped residual that is non-aqueous phase that's no longer very mobile. And I'm going to take a look at that uh, non-mobile part right in here. Uh, over in the right, we have this light non-aqueous phase liquid, something like a gasoline, a hydrocarbon spill. It's heavier than air. It moves down through the Vado zone, still leaving a trail of capillary uh, residual, if you wish. But since it's heavier than water, it doesn't penetrate too far into the saturated zone. It sort of floats somewhere in the vicinity of the water table in a process we're still trying to understand. As the water table moves up and down, however, some of this uh, non-aqueous phase goes down and then it retreats back up. When it retreats back up, it too leaves a capillary trap residual, very similar to that over here in this dense non-aqueous phase liquid. Uh, typical denapple might be perchloroethylene or, um, and other chlorinated solvents. I think we have confusion in the signal here. I'll try again. Okay, let's take a look at this light non-aqueous phase liquid, the one that floats, so to speak, at the water table, something like gasoline. And then this micromodel, this is an enormous micromodel. This micromodel must be two and a half feet tall and maybe uh, uh, almost a foot wide. And what we've done is we've etched in a whole pore system here to represent the aquifer. And on the left side, we've etched in a large pore to represent the well in the system. And it's really easy to do. It's just like making a big room like this. You just put a lot more hydrofluoric acid in it, leave it there a lot longer, and um, uh, over a much broader area. Of course, like most rooms in a building like this, you have to leave some pillars in here so that the ceiling doesn't collapse on top of you. And that's what you see in there. And then we have little etches in between those to represent the well screen in this system. And so what we see in this case is uh, a Vado zone with air, water in it, and some oil, a floating product, if you wish, and beneath that, a water-saturated uh, zone. And this is sort of the setup for doing the experiment. It's transmitted light and recorded on videotape and um, film. Uh, if we take a close-up look at the bottom of the, of the uh, Vado zone, where we have air that's continuous, we then move into the non-aqueous phase. Uh, in here, the, say, this floating hydrocarbon. One thing you'll notice that although there's hydrocarbon in the aquifer, there is none in the adjacent well in this vicinity. And that's one of the features of these systems and one of the reasons why there is a, there's a big difference between what you see in a monitoring well and what you see in an aquifer, one of the issues that people are concerned with in dealing with this issue, uh, this, this problem. Um, and that's because the pores in the aquifer are very much smaller than the pores in, in the uh, in the, in the well, the well itself is one giant pore. Uh, there are a variety of forces that play a role in these, these situations. Let's take a closer up lo a look at the sy system by going to the picture on the right. Here we have the pores saturated with oil and some water. We'll come back to that in a minute. And above that, the Vado zone with air. And over in the well, there is no oil. Um, 
there are basically three forces we're going to talk about in looking at these pore level systems today and, and looking at the fluids. The first of these is gravity, and that refers to the difference in density between the different fluids. Air is lighter than oil, is lighter than water, and that's why the model stratifies the way it does. The second is an issue of uh, capillarity, and that relates to the interfacial tensions between the fluid pairs, air, oil, oil, water, and uh, air, uh, air, water, where it exists up here, um, and the pore size pore sizes in the system, basically how big are these pore throats and, and pore bodies. And in this particular case, the biggest pore in the entire system is the well. So it has a totally different capillary force in it, and that's the principal reason why what you see in an observation well is different than what you see in an aquifer. And when looking at floating product, for example, or in putting in a skimmer well over here, affecting its efficiency. Um, the other thing to notice if you take a look at this picture, you see some dispersion or diffusion of the uh, capillary fringe. There is the bottom uh, most point at which the air saturates this slide anyway. And if you follow the liquids all the way up, I believe they go somewhere up in here. It's hard for me to see. But uh, quite a few pores up. And that's some m measure of, say, the capillary uh, thickness in this, in this kind of case. Another evidence for capillary forces in this system. Uh, the final force we'll talk about later on will be regarding flowing forces or viscous forces, and they don't occur in this particular situation. Let's, let's see what happens as we go down in this model. As we go down a little bit further, we find in the oil-saturated zone that there's still water present. Water is ubiquitous here. These models are water wet. That means the solid has a greater affinity for the water than it does for the non-aqueous phase liquid or for the air. In fact, it has the greatest affinity for water and the least affinity for air, and the non-aqueous phase is sort of somewhere in between. Uh, there, therefore, we call these models water-wet models. Most aquifers are water-wet aquifers, but not necessarily all of them, and uh, they can be modified by contamination in the system, which can adsorb onto the solid, altering the, altering the wettability. Um, so all we're doing is water-wet experiments here. And as a consequence, there is water in pendular rings in this domain, and there's also water present as a film everywhere. It's at the ceiling and at the floor and in the wedges. It's basically surrounding the entire pore, and the oil is sort of in the middle of the pore. Now, that water film can be very thin, particularly at the ceiling and the floor. It can be just a few molecular layers uh, thi uh, thick, but it's still there everywhere. Okay, let's go further down the system until we run out of the non-aqueous phase is shown here on the right. At least in the aquifer, over in the well, it still exists because of the difference in capillary uh, forces. Uh, as we come over here in the aquifer and look in this water-saturated domain, what we see are little blobs or drops of the non-aqueous phase. The water table had fluctuated over here in the past, and as it went down and then rebounded and came back up and pushed the oil interface up, it left trapped behind by capillary forces these little blobs. And these are one of the principal causes of uh, the difficulties we have in cleaning up non-aqueous phases uh, of this kind, of the floating kind. Go down a little bit further, and we eventually run out of the non-aqueous phase in the well. We go back to water. Over here in the aquifer, we have these little blobs. So we see how you can create this capillary trapping in these little blobs. Now notice, because this is a non-wetting fluid relative to water, that is the non-aqueous phase is non-wetting relative to water, these little blobs are trapped off as bubbles or blobs that are not connected, unlike the water. And that lack of connection is what really makes them tough to fix. Okay. I haven't yet mastered this thing. <laughs> What I have is a, a, each of my little push buttons here controls two slide projectors, although it's only supposed to control one. Let me give it a shot again. There we go. Okay, let's try a slightly different experiment. Let's do a simulation of a denapple spill. So imagine an aquifer saturated with water, down below the water table, and up from the top comes a dense non-aqueous phase liquid, and it displaces the water as it moves through the system, okay? So it's pushing water out of the way, but not all the water out of the way because this water is wetting and so it fills some of the poor throats and there's a film basically everywhere. And then let's suppose it goes all the way to the bottom of the aquifer. And what I've done is put together a little micromodel. It's six inches long. 
and it's water saturated, and we bring a non-aqueous phase in from the top. We just happen to use an oil, but it could have been anything. Uh, and it's dyed red, and the water's dyed blue. And we observe it as it moves through. And then what we do is we displace water through the system after it, sort of simulating that this non-aqueous phase liquid has come down into the aquifer and then moved on down further into the aquifer and has been replaced by water. And when you finish with that, this is the kind of thing you see. You see these little blobs. This is the non-aqueous phase residual saturation that we have to clean up at a denapple site. Finding and cleaning up these things is difficult. These are the principal reasons why sources of dense non-aqueous phases last forever. They take a long time to dissolve. Uh, it's a principal reason why their uh, cleanup activities are, are, are rate limited. That is, when you turn the remediation system and go off, uh, concentrations uh, rise back up fairly rapidly. How do they get created? Well, let's take a look at this guy in the middle. Imagine this model full of water, and then oil comes in, filling up most of the model with oil, except for a water film and the odd pendular uh, ring, uh, odd poor throat with water in it. But it's mostly filled with oil. And now a front of water comes in from the top. The oil retreats to the bottom. As this water comes in from the top, it's wetting. It wicks around the walls. And in this particular case, it wicked around the walls faster than the oil, this non-aqueous phase, could be displaced out of that poor body. And as a consequence, the water came around both sides and then snapped off the interface, trapping by a process known as snap off in the petroleum industry, this particular blob. This one was trapped in a slightly different way. The water, when it came through the system, was able to bypass it around both sides. And before this non-aqueous phase could displace downward, say through this pore or that one, the water managed to get around both sides and close off on it, bypassing it. Now, bypassing is a very important phenomena because as we'll see, it applies at all different scales, including the scale of meters, and leads to a, a lot of the contamination problems we have. Uh, let's do a similar experiment, but instead of using a uh, micromodel, we'll use a, a little sand column. And uh, we'll pack it with dirt, excuse me, with sand here. <laughs> uh, we'll pack it with something. And uh, then we'll force fluids through it, and we'll initially saturate it with water, and then we'll bring in our non-aqueous phase liquid. And then we'll displace that with water again, simulating this denapple moving on down to the bottom of the aquifer. Uh, pick the right denapple, pick the right non-aqueous phase, rather, and let's use styrene for the experiment. And styrene is nice because we can put a monomer of styrene in, and then when we want to freeze the experiment, we can polymerize it. And once we polymerize the experiment, the, the non-aqueous phase is hardened we can look at where it is within the pore system. And if you break off the top of this model and look down into the system after this sequence of events that the non-aqueous phase has come in, the styrene in this case, and then it's been displaced by water, and look at what's left behind as residual, and if you happen to have dyed the styrene with a fluorescent dye, you see this ubiquitous population of little blobs of styrene all over the top of the model. And it's that thing that you're trying to clean up in denapple sites, that residual saturation. Let's take a closer up look at it. On the right is a photomicrograph of a thin section of that stuff. This is a blob of styrene, and there's another one. These are solid grains, and you can imagine the porosity in here. It's hard for me to see from this angle. And what you're looking at is a blob of styrene, that residual phase, in the same experiment we just pictured, up close. Okay, and that's the stuff you're trying to, to get rid of by dissolving it out or pushing it out with some kind of pump and treat system. Um, by the way, it's basically impossible to push these things out in any physically realistic aquifer. The uh, capillary forces are, are simply too strong. Uh, the way we made this, this photomicrograph basically was to harden the styrene and then replace the water with epoxy, and that made a nice hard rock which we could thin section. If instead of doing the epoxy, we simply uh, melted the sand away with acids so we could look at the styrene blobs, these are the kinds of things you'd see. This is a singlet blob filling one poor body. Here's one filling one, two, three, four, or more pore bodies, and there's a clear pore throat right in there. So this is a non-aqueous phase liquid, and these are the things we're trying to clean up. Now, we're interested in what these things look like because the principal way we have of cleaning these things up today is to dissolve them away, either uh, just using aqueous flow or to enhance solubility by adding, say, a surfactant or an alcohol. Um, if you look at them, their surface area to volume ratio plays a big role in the efficiency of that kind of mass transfer operation. Obviously, this thing has a lot more surface area uh, to uh, volume than, say, uh, 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 some of these other guys. Uh, 
Another fact that comes into play is suppose the solubility is only occurring over a small portion of the blob, not over the entire thing. You might imagine in this pore space, only the tip of the blob over here, near uh, the larger part of the pore, is where the solubility is occurring. So it's solubilizing from the corner. Now in a single component non-aqueous phase, like a perchloroethylene spill or something, that's probably not important. But if this is gasoline, it has many components in it, some are much more soluble than others, the ones that are most soluble will quickly come out of so, uh, into solution here and then be depleted in this portion of the blob. To continue their solubilization, they'll have to diffuse from the interior of the blob. And that can take a while. And it depends on the tortuosity, the complexity of the geometry of the blob. Here's one that's quite messy. And so it's going to take a lot longer to diffuse there. And so what happens with multi-component systems is you've got to worry about the topology of these things and its position within the pore space, understanding where the solubilization is occurring. Now, uh, I have a videotape that we'll show later this afternoon, and I'll uh, announce the time for that later on. But it also raises the speculation there actually may be some shear force driven currents inside these blobs, which uh, would change that picture considerably. Uh, just a different uh, view of the same situation. Here's a, a doublet blob, two pore bodies and one pore throat, it's sort of the same thing here. Notice that the film of water in the vicinity of the pore throat in this photomicrograph is quite thin. How much flow is occurring in that region compared to the flow in the pore out here bypassing uh, the end of the blob? So we speculate that most of the mass transfer may be occurring at the ends and very little is occurring on this inter inter intermediate interface. And you might speculate looking at that model over there at the same way. Uh, more recently, I've done some experiments that make me challenge that, that notion. Uh, in any event, keep that in mind. Mass transfer limitations are a big deal. If you're worried about bacteria, you can bring up some similar issues in terms of limitations. Not all aquifers are homogeneous, however, as many of us know. Go out and look at any outcrop, and you see that the geologic structure is quite variable. Let's emulate that in this model, or mimic it, by simply making some of the pores bigger than the neighbors, okay? And we do that by just uh, putting a little bit uh, darker ink on the page when we make the transparency for the etching. And uh, consequently, the etches are a little deeper and a little wider. And let's do make sort of finite width coarse material lenses. We could think of this as a coarse sand in a medium sand or a medium sand in a fine sand. The contrast in materials is not that large here. And then let's pretend like we're looking at denapple on the bottom of the aquifer that's migrating along the bottom. And it's encountering these heterogeneities as it moves. Okay. And what happens is because this dense non-aqueous phase is less wetting than the water, it likes the big pore spaces. Remember, it liked the well in the case of the light non-aqueous phase. It likes the big pore spaces, so it likes these coarse lenses. So as it migrates through the aquifer, it preferentially migrates in the coarse lenses. What happens, however, is since these are a finite length, it just fills one up and then the front of the non-aqueous phase advances till it encounters another one, and it just fills them up sequentially as it moves through the system. And it creates a kind of dispersion of the movement of this stuff through the, through the aquifer. However, that dispersion is more or less limited by the wavelength of these heterogeneities. This is later in the experiment. You can see it's basically about the same kind of dispersion of the front. In fact, there is the non-aqueous phase just beginning to fill up a coarse lens. Okay. If these ins lenses, instead of being finite in length, were essentially infinitely long layers, we'd get an infinite amount of dispersion. That is, the oil would move preferentially through the coarse layers and not enter the fine layers in, in this simulation. Okay. What happens at the end of this experiment is, of course, you end up with a model that's more or less full of non-aqueous phase, just like we would in the homogeneous case. There's still water present. If you look carefully, there's water present as a film everywhere. There's water present as um, uh, filling some of the poor throats as pendular rings, and there's some bypass regions of water uh, where uh, the oil simply didn't uh, penetrate, so there's maybe several poor bodies or more uh, that still have a water in it. Now let's clean this aquifer up. Let's put in a pump and treat system where we push water uh, from one side to the other.